Yo, yo, yo. This is Ocean's View Podcast. Number one podcast in the world. I gotta take my time with this one. This right here is special. This is a special one. Me being a Harlem kid. Growing up in New York City. Uptown BX, everything. The guy who I'm actually about to interview technically doesn't need any type of introduction. But for those of you that don't know, that weren't outside, that weren't in touch with the 80s, especially with the street life and everything, y'all need to stand up, applaud everything. I'm over here interviewing my man AZ Faison. Mob Style's own. Harlem's own AZ Faison. What up, babe? Oh, what up, family? The ocean in the building. Yeah, all in the building, respecting in the '80s. Y'all know what it is, man. Y'all know what it is. Yo, so so we we is we not going to cheat this at all. We going we going right from the beginning because we not going to rush it. We ain't going to be like all oh, everybody else. We got we got trapped. We going to talk about all this. We, we got a lot to talk about because yes, sir. Yes, sir. you big on authenticity. You're huge on it. Yes, you, you've made that abundantly clear for me. So, you know, let us, let us know, like, where you grew up at? Hey. I grew up in Harlem, uh, Sugar Hill, 146, St. Nick, Sugar Hill section. Um, well, all the nightclubs used to be up there, the gambling spots. I grew up, like, in the Vegas of Harlem mm. at that time, in the 80s. You know what I mean? Yeah, working in the cleanest up there, the cleanest, one thing led to the next. And that's that's what my hood, bro. How? So like in that time, but you because you grew up first generation hip hop. Okay. You grew up first generation hip hop. So like, what was the influence? And like, like take us back to that time with hip hop. What was going on in Sugar Hill and everything else? Like, what was going on at that time in Phil? Uh, my first introduction to hip hop was like cats used to be jamming at the parks and shit. You know, that's when they, the microphones get from behind the ropes. Mm -hmm. You know, they were cutting this shit to do hip hop. You know, it's before these songs and shit. And the first rap song I heard was uh, Rapper Delight on the radio, Sugar Hill. You know, a big band, Hank. And that shit sold like 17 million copies. The whole world was introduced to like hip hop. You feel me? That's my first introduction to hip hop. Then after that, I think you had uh, Melly Mel and them come on the set. And then after that, you know, I think that's when the uh, Run DMC era came in. And then after that, it was like uh, the Rock Kim and them era. That's, that's the era that we came up in, like, in the streets. The streets was loving that Rock Kim, Cool G Rap. You know, I think Rock Kim the God and uh, G Rap is KRS One, Chuck D. You know what I mean? I salute to them dudes. I could never be on their level in rapping because that's, that's, that's what they do. But, uh, yeah, that's where I come from on the rap, bro. So, the influence... Slick Rick and, you know, brand new beings. Yeah. Okay, so, clearly they had an influence on how you was moving. Um, before you actually... So, it's like, who who were, like, the dudes that were doing it back then? What you mean? Like, who, who were the cats that... Who were the street dudes that were, like, doing it before... You and, you know, Rich and Poe and started doing what y'all like. Who was the cats that y'all looked up to? Like, okay, they, they get money out here. See, I come from on Sugar Hill section. So on my side, um, it was it was older cats. Older cats. Um, you had, you had, um, there was a spot called 4-4. That's where the first crack spot was. It wasn't even a crack. It was called Freebase. And them dudes had to be making at least about $40,000 a day. 
or more, or more, maybe forty thousand an hour. That shit was just crazy. That was like the first free bake spot that I know in Harlem. Um, and you, you know, they had the gambling spots up there. All the dudes used to come through there. Uh, a lot of cats. And some dudes, I don't even want to say names. Okay, okay, not definitely, definitely. You know, for certain reasons, man. But, um, yeah, but uh, niggas looked up to Bat before us. Bat, Jerome Harris, uh, Nicky Barnes, uh, Guy Fisher, uh, Pee Wee Kirkland. You hear these names and shit, man. And you, you respect them and uh, salute to all those dudes, man. So Guy Fisher they really definitely bought... definitely pioneers of the game. Guy Fisher, he really bought the Apollo? To my knowledge, to my knowledge, definitely, that's what I heard. You know, I was, I'm not, you know, I mean, everybody know that now. No, okay. Yeah, but definitely, but, uh, yeah, got fishing. So, so, with them guys doing what they was doing and stuff like that, because I kind of just want to jump into it. So, what was your relationship with Rich? Like, I, like how did that relationship cultivate? Y'all grew up in the same area? Yeah, definitely. Rich lived on Convent. Okay. 146, and I live right one block down on St. Nicholas on 146. So, you know, Rich was in the game before me, though. Rich was like 13. He was uh, selling hair on shit, you feel me? And I was still working in the cleaners. Mm. So um, he used to give me certain things to hold for him. Guns, drugs, some time. And, um, like the movie said that I, that uh, he, you know, the Lulu drugs was found, but it was really one of Rich Guns and Mr. Jimmy, that's when he let me go, he fired me out of the cleaners, but it was, that's how I met Rich, that was my man, and um, but Rich, 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 Rich was 13, but how Rich started hustling is amazing in itself, because he started selling sage and eggs, like he cook up sage and eggs, and it just smelled like hash, and he was selling to the white boy, and that's how he really started hustling, then one thing led to the next, he started moving, um, Heron, the next thing you know, that nigga pulled up on us with a brand new BMW and shit. You feel me? At the age of about 14 years old. Wow. So, okay, because I'm sitting there, you got trapped right here. We're going to get into that. From your knowledge and how you feel, because you got to think about it. A lot of people that are not from New York, they saw the movie and they take the movie as that's the law. So if you have the number within percentage-wise, how much of the movie was more closely related to it being actually the real story told? I tell people all the time, it's like 70%. It's, you feel me? it's a good movie and it has some facts in it. But they might put this in front of that and that in the back of that and that didn't happen then, you know what I mean? So you can't knock it. So they did a great job, you know, all the characters was good, I'm not shitting on nobody, respect Dane for getting it off, but uh, the business wasn't done correctly, you know, I'm always be mad at that, but um, at the end of the day, it was a good film, and I respect it because it, it kept the legacy of Rich Porter alive, and our legacy alive, it's just, you know, but uh, it's about 70%, it's about 70% to answer that question. That's, 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 that's a good, that's a good percent, so... Question that I always had for myself was so when you started hustling, how much of it was out of necessity and how much of it was out of like, you know what? I see my man, he around my age, he doing his numbers, I need to do something. Um, working in the cleaners, right? Rich used to come in with clothes and shit, like a whole bunch of new clothes just to get them hemmed and niggas with the permanent creases in it. And this nigga pulling out a knot of money, paying for that shit in advance. You know, I'm, I'm watching this shit. You know, I'm a kid. You feel me? I'm working in the clean. It's like, wow. You know, brand new BMW. You know, so those things definitely would gave you, like, a concern. But when I went to the, being honest, when I went to the movie and seen Scarface, that's what made me like, yo. You know what I mean? I know that put a battery in me, so... When I did stumble upon the opportunity, there was no doubt about it, I was, I was going to get involved. You understand? And pursue some paper, too. Keep it in honor. Now, I always hear you reference Scarface being, you know, having a certain effect on you. See, because it was, see, for me, every time I heard you say that, I was single digits when Scarface came out. Okay. So, for me, it was more just acting. Like, it was just a good movie. So... What was it in Scarface that kind of had you up? I always like just wonder that. Rags I'm, the Riches, man. Rags, that was it? Rags the Riches, bro. 
as the rich and, and not knowing, you know, at the time of how it, how how easy it looked. This shit, you feel me? The whole thing to me in Scarface, like damn, if he wouldn't have killed, if he would have killed them kids, he would still be on. Mm -hmm. But you know, he had his conscience, you know, I guess, and he couldn't go that far. And I said to myself, man, if I ever get in the game. I'm not. I'm not going to try to make it to be that thing. Mm -hmm. You understand? I just take care of all those, stay local, and make sure everybody eat. we gonna win. And um, that's how I played the game, bro. But that Scarface definitely introduced me into like how that should go. You know what I mean? I always wanted to know. Let's let's put the game aside for a second. What were like your dreams and aspirations before the game? Like, the game doesn't exist for you. What what was in AZ's mind? Like, yo, I want to do this when I get older. When I was in school, I wanted to play ball. I was kind of decent. I could play, but I um, being broke. You know, opportunity for a job. It, I quit school. I dropped out of school in ninth grade because I wanted to work in the cleaners full time to make more money and shit. Support my family, so... That's how that went, bro. It wasn't like I was a bad kid and none of that dumb shit. It was just being fucked up. And my mom thinks ain't nothing because we needed the bread. So that's that's what happened, bro. So, so now, so now you're in the game. So now you're in the game. Now, I want you to walk me through, because like you said, it was the gun in real life. Because we go on authentic. It was the gun that got you out of the cleaners. Yes, sir. So now you're out the cleaners. What? How that first sale went? Because I'm trying to figure out when you got to work. Because if, if I was somebody just going off the well, work, I, I, it was I had to work right before. Okay. The gun. So I'm rocking after hours. All right. You feel me? Like when the cleaners closed, the cleaners owner would go home, but I would still be in the cleaners because I still got to hang up the clothes, put the, the tags on, and shit. I was staying there a couple of hours late and the customers would come and holler at me and I was rocking like that while in the cleaners and shit. But, but also what was going on, what made him concerned to even search for anything in the cleaners. Like when I used, when, we, when the store was open, them niggas used to be outside, like customers waving oh. and shit. Like, yo. And I would act like I'm going in the store and he would, you know, like, what's going on? And it brought a concern and that's when he's, he, you know, his concern. He found the gun and the next thing you know, he's like, nigga, I know what's going on. I can't have this in my spot. Either you gonna leave that alone or you gonna leave me alone. And I'm like, look, oh, <laughs> I'm getting seventy five dollars a week here. Mm -hmm. When I left the cleaners, bro, I was getting seventy five hundred a week. Mm. You feel me? And that shit turned into an hour and then, you know, thirty thousand a day. For real. I'll never forget. Maybe like two months, so three months after he fired me, I bought a brand new 190 Benz. And I didn't want to, I ain't want to park right in front of the cleanest, but that was the only parking spot. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, oh, you showing off now? That shit ain't going to last long. You know, but then eventually down the line, one day he saw me, you know, in a um, true story. He said, come here for me. And I came inside the cleanest. I'm in the game now. I'm heavy and shit. And he was like, man, I'm about to lose my spot, man. You know, shit ain't, ain't you know, how it used to be. And I, he said, man, I need like $3,000 to pay for the back rent. I had called my man Stan Stanley right upstairs. Yo, Stan, bring down $5,000 for me. He Stan bought down five. And I gave it to him. He said, I'll pay you back. I said, nah, Mr. Jimmy, you gave me an opportunity, bro. I work here, man. Thanks, man. You can keep that, bro. For real, man, I'll give it up. Nah, Jimmy. True story, bro. So, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I respect anybody and give anybody the opportunity under the circumstances. Even though I know I was getting robbed 75 hours a week, bro. But the fuck, I'm a kid, bro. Mm -hmm. Gave me a job. Mm -hmm. So, you're in the game. Yes, sir. You're out the cleaners, $75 turned into $7,500. Yes, sir. Who was the connect? Uh, a cat named Lulu. Oh, so that so, story. So that one was true. Okay. He definitely had to give Lulu his profits. My man, salute to Lulu, rest in peace. Okay. Lulu, Lulu was the dude, bro. Lulu made sure a lot of niggas was eating, man. If it wasn't, 
if it wasn't for Lulu, it wouldn't be no Mark Dowell, it wouldn't be no paid in full, it wouldn't be none of this shit, bro. Being honest, he was the he financed the whole show. If you if you really think about it, you know what I mean. So how did you get connected with Lulu? How did I get? Lulu had a pool hall on 157th Street. Okay. And uh, my man took me in there one day, and I think he was shopping something, a little something. And then uh, after that, I wound up finding some drugs, and I wanted more. I told homie to take me up there, and I wasn't scout going up there, and I was going up there on the regular. To the pool hall to see Lulu. Regular, meaning like I took a hundred dollars, turned that to four hundred dollars, four hundred dollars, turned that into eight hundred dollars. Going back and back, then he was like, "Oh, hold on, hold on." He asked one of his people, "Like, yo, this, why you keep coming back?" To, you know what I mean? Like, who the fuck are you? Like, and he told his man, "Like, yo, go with him and see what he's doing." So when I took him, he came with me. I took him back to the block where I was hustling at, and he seen all the customers waiting. And when he went back, he said, "Yo, you're fishing." That's what Lulu said. "Yo, come in." He said, you keep coming here, take this, and, and let's go. You ain't got to keep running back from that small shit. Then one thing led to the next, and then we became in love. I met his family, his mom, and everything, bro. Took me in the house, bro. I was moving that thing for real. Okay. So, so Rich is already... Rich so in Rich, the game. Rich, Rich in the game, but he goes to jail. Rich get locked up for about a year, and that's when I really... To get in control of the streets by them. Well, that thing, from what I'm hearing, the jails a lot of time hear hear about what's going on in the streets before even the streets. Definitely, bro. Definitely. So you had no contact with Rich the whole time he was in, because of course the streets is talking. He he know his man is moving nah, is doing he, he, digits. He's calling me. He's calling me every one every morning oh, and shit. Every two days he call. He call me. Just tell him get on, nigga. Get home. Everything all right. Let's get home, man. Let's make it out of it. We, we, all, we all right. We good. Okay. Okay. All right. So now Rich is home. Rich is home now. You put him on. That's your man. He's not even put him on. Let's because, go right to the car uh, shop, Nick. What you want, man? Got the Psalm 9000. What you need? Gave him a few dollars. Gave him a brick. And Rich gone from there. He know what to do. He gone, bro. So you're hitting rich now. I gave him a brick. Okay. Bought him a car. Do you, my nigga. And he took off from there. He had he, he made his own connections and like that. Oh, so yeah. Rich had his own connect and There was so many connects out there, but Lulu fucking with me and I know my you know, the competition is not. So Rich would come, you know, it, 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 I can't explain it, man, but it's like Rich was in the game before me, he can't, like, I can't buy that, I mean, this dude, you know what I mean? But Yeah, okay. In a way, but the love is, we still won. If he need it, nigga, I got it, man. Come on, man. I'm telling him, leave the niggas alone, nigga, stay here. You feel me? All right. But, uh, it is what it is. It's no problem. So now, I looked at him as the boss, just by him being in the game before me. Oh, so you gave, okay, you gave you know, out to him. You understand what I mean? You get out to him. Okay. Yeah. Explain to me where... When Alpo came into when he came into play, did you hear of him prior to? Because he's from the after East LA. Side. LA got killed. After LA got killed, LA got killed. Then Rich went to prison, and then before before we went to prison, he was I seen him with Rich a few times, like in the car. I didn't we never met, but I would see him in the car with Rich and shit. So when Rich went to jail. Uh, it was a basketball game. I rode past the basketball game, and he was on a bike. He was following me. He got off the bike. We talked. And he told me, oh, he was getting some work from Rich. Rich locked up now. I don't know where to get it from. I said, yo, listen, Rich going to call me in the morning. When he, I'm going to speak on you. He said, if he, if he say fuck with you, we're going we gonna to work. And Rich gave me the okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what man. Look out until he, until I get back on the set. And I took him right in. Took him right in, bro. I gave out a spot, the jukebox. And that shit was a gold mine. That shit was making like $80,000 a week. I gave it to Al Paul. Mm. I, had like other, I had like four of the gates that were doing that type of thing. Mm. So, we're going to take a break for a second. 
This is part one. We're going to get into it. We're going to leave it right where that's set. Right back. Ocean's view. Yup, yup, we back. Ocean's View, the podcast. We're sitting here, sitting here with AZ. We're just getting warmed up. So, you're in the game, people are eating. You're making sure everybody's eating, the ones that want to fuck with you and everything else. How did the hood take you? How did the hood take you once the hood realized you, you were the guy? It was all love, man. It was definitely all love. We cut this off. I don't cut it on. Mm -hmm. For a second. Uh, it was definitely all love, bro. It was all love. Everybody eating, everybody pushing foreign cars. Everybody involved. It's taking so long to get this shit off. That's a good time. You good? Yes, sir. Everybody pushing foreign cars. It's, it was, it's, I don't know, man. It was, that shit was like, Heaven, man, everything was beautiful, bro. You know, let, let me just share this with y'all, man. Instead of beating around the bush, it's like when it was what it was. It was all love. Everybody was good. The hood expected certain shit from us. You feel me? They expected us to do a bus ride every year, a free bus ride, eight nine buses just come. They got dressed for that day, like that. That was a day for them, like mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Whatever we do it. Um, Take them to Great Adventures, Johnny Park, you know, Virginia Beach. Um, throw Christmas parties for the kids. We gave away mopeds, dirt bikes. You know, the, the parents, they got a free TV and a raffle. The old people, 125. They, the hood expected that every year from us. Mm -hmm. They even expected Alpo, you know. He, was, he would run down. To Chinatown and spend in there fifty or forty thousand dollars on fireworks to light up the hood on the west side, come over to the east side, light up his hood. They expected that every year. You feel me? So it was a love that was that we had from that, from doing that. It wasn't just because we had nice cars and girls. The young kids expected us. They liked it to see our on his bike. They liked it to see what kind of car he got. You know, it was like an audience. We put on a show, bro. We didn't even know it, bro. We were just being who the fuck we were. Being mm -hmm. honest at that time. So, the fact that there's other cats eating and doing everything else, too, what made y'all stand out? What I believe made them stand out because we was buying, we was buying cars like sneakers, bro. And anybody, the shit we, you know, we was buying was like, what the fuck is that, man? Mm hmm you know what I mean? We like in 86, but we pushing 88 joints. Mm. We go into the car dealer like, we don't want that shit on the floor, nigga. I want this shit in the German magazine. Give me that, nigga. You can't get that, nigga. Take this hundred cash. Give me the change, man. I need that. Mm -hmm. And then we get it for us, bro. So we we like push, you know, the latest joint. And we shopping like this on the regular, bro. I mean, cats was coming from different boroughs, different states, like, because they heard about us, the cars we had and shit. Just to take pictures and shit the cars, man. For real, bro. So, quick. In a month, what's the, the most amount of cars you think you copped in a month? Just on your... It wasn't in a month. I don't say in a month. It might, you know, I might cop a new car every two months. Every two months, okay. You, you understand? Was it like in a month? Or, yeah. But by the time I done bought a car, Rich done bust out one month, so Poe just bust out. You know, it was like, you know, niggas having fun, bro. Yeah, having fun with each other, competition. It wasn't even competition. We, we was like, you know, that new Porsche coming out. Yo, I'm going to grab that. Yo, I like the new 7. You know, whatever whatever was new, man, we just had to have that shit, bro. Mm-hmm. For real. So now, I want to talk about Mob style. How did mob style come about? Mob style came about after I got shot. It was like that was def that's the next thing I said to myself. Because after I got shot, I felt the police was on me, and I wanted to do something 
that was cool to do, you understand, mm -hmm. that uh, people would respect and, and maybe you could win with that shit just as well. Because nobody was talking that type of shit. Hands on being involved in that type of world at that time. If I felt like that, if I tell my story on wax, that shit would flow. That's when I wrote the song Mob Style, but my intention was not to be a rapper. I had my little man with Wild. Okay. I was writing for him. And you I was, was right. You was right. I wrote, I wrote the song Mob Style for Whip Wop. Okay. All right. And I was going to fund him. And I would, you know, be the back of the Whip Wop. We were right for that nigga talking mm -hmm. that shit. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. And I did the song for reference. I gave it to Whip. But my man was my, my sister's boyfriend. She was working for BLS. And I gave him a cassette. I said, yo, listen to this joint, bro. And tell me what you think. Later on that, that day, he gave it to Mr. Magic, and Mr. Magic played it on the radio on some make it and break it shit in the streets. They were loving that shit, so he played it back again. And he said, yo, dog, I think we got some of the young niggas to go in the studio and work on the album. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I was like, word? He said, yeah, and that's, and that's how that shit started, bro. So, so, okay, we already know, Rich and Pope, they not rapping. Nah, they were Tone, laughing at me, bro. Tone Capone, and Gangsta Lou. When I first let Rich hear that shit, Rich and Paul, I let them hear together. I was like, yo, come on, that shit ain't gonna work, man. That shit ain't gonna work. But when they when they heard on the radio, they were like, oh, that shit, yo, 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 yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go. You feel me? But Rich, Rich never, around that same time, that's when that shit happened to his little brother. Okay. And Rich got murdered before the album was ever done. You understand? Well, Rich was, was already dead? He was dead, bro. Oh, boy, I didn't even notice that. I don't know why he put the two together at the time. He was still working on the album. He died and shit, so. We had finished the, 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 uh, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly album, but that was done. It was ready to release it. And um, that shit happened to Rich. And then, you know, that's when I said, you know what, man? That's when I started writing uh, What's Going On, Black. Mm -hmm. I had wrote it on a piece of paper, and it wasn't supposed to be a song. I was just in my thoughts, just like asking myself some fucking questions. Like, Man, bro, my nigga gotta die, huh? And I had to put this shit in my drawer. And I had this girl at my house. I was living in Long Island. And I let her stay there. And I went to the city for a minute. I said, I'm gonna go to the city. I'll be back. And she calling me, like, crying and shit. Yo, what you gonna do? Kill yourself? I was looking in your drawer. I know I shouldn't be looking in your drawer. I found this letter. Don't, don't bug out. Come back. I was like, let me go the fuck back. I don't fuck this shit talking about. I looked at the letter. I'm like, wow, this shit is deep. I said, this shit gotta be a song, man. And that's, that's when I went in the studio and did What's Going On, Black. And I did the whole album based around that type of feel. And that's when I did the Streetwise album. You feel me? See, see for me, the good, the bad, the ugly, That's that that was, of course, the introduction. Yeah. That was the introduction. That was, that was the first to me, man. You know what I mean? The first gangster rap album ever. Ever. Period. Period. And, uh, and, and it was it was Harlem, you feel me? Mm -hmm. It didn't maybe expand, but niggas from all over used to come to the hood to get that cassette tape, bro. Because mm -hmm. they heard about it. Like, real, like niggas that was involved with the gang, they respected that shit. Mm -hmm. And even when you when they had them, the cassettes in jail, I heard the COs used to confiscate them shit. It's like it was a fucking shank or something. They, they couldn't play this in prison. Mm -hmm. That's how real that shit was and connected to what was going on. You feel me? Because the feds was investigating us and it was real, man. And that's why Mob Style didn't blow because the government said, nah, nah. But I peaked it and I just shut the shit down. You feel me? I seen an interview with you before explaining something to that effect and you were saying how people are start getting indicted over the stuff you said you had to curb a yeah. lot of the things you were saying. Yeah, I had to shut it down, personally speaking, because it was in there. It was in there. It was in there. It was in there. I don't want to go back and bark on, you know, um, but it was a nigga I knew that was in a position to take the mob style shit to the next level. So I would go see the dude, and I'm like, yo, dog, our shit is on fire in the streets, nigga. Let's eat. Because he already sold his company, whatever, that sold like $17 million, 17 million copies of and what was hot at his time we blew up. Mm -hmm. Nick, the streets want this right now, man. I'm selling like a thousand 
joints a week. Mm-hmm. Myself, you feel me? And the store is like thirsty for this shit. So, nigga, let's take it to the next level. He was like, all right, cool. Then he introduced me to someone that he said that put a uh, that worked for Eric B and Rock Kim that made him successful. I'm like, where? And I started fucking with that dude, and that dude wound up being a fed. I know where you're going with this, and I want you to stop right there because we're going to talk about that chat. So I was like, I, I didn't want you to keep going because I once you started talking, I knew you was yeah, going. Yeah, but, that shit. Yeah, but yeah, before we get to I'm, him, I'm gonna leave it alone. What's next? Before before we get to him, I need to know how the hell did y'all start beefing with NWA? The beef started. I think Tone might have do the first doc. And a song that he did called Stomping the Suckers from Compton. I think they must have heard that shit. And then they came back with the, uh, I think, the Nigga for Life album. The Nigga for Life album. And yeah. he went crazy on us. Nigga, 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 please. I was like, wow. Then I went in the studio. I did a song because I don't really want to diss nobody. Mm-hmm. This and them. And um, that's how it started. But the dude. Put the battery in the same guy. I don't, you know, mm-hmm. you know. But then I, when I when I fell back, I analyzed. I said, "Oh, these niggas just trying to create a, a war." Mm-hmm. That's how I felt in my spirit. Like, you know, this dude with the government. He didn't want. Yo, y'all gotta get back. You know, ancient us. I said, "Yeah, something ain't right, man." But um, it, it didn't go no further past that song. After I don't really want to diss nobody. I shut the shit down. Fuck it. I don't, I don't want no parts of the rap game. It's nasty. Something's going on that I could see, and I'm gonna fall back, man. But um, I think they took the last shot. They did. They took the last shot. On it, what? It was a nigga for um nigga for life album. Cause that's when Easy E said um little streetwise nigga. You know yeah, me. They, they did that, and then I came back. I don't really want to diss. So them, this but, joint came afterwards. Yeah, okay, all yeah. right. So I went first. Mm-hmm. Easy and them came back. Then I did that, but then I shut the shit down because it just felt. Strange, but uh, when I think Ice Cube came to the Apollo, ah, uh, knew where I was going with that. That's when Alpha went up, uh, you know, the old Apollo. I so, think the niggas ran the niggas out the building, some shit like that. Yeah, I wasn't there, man, but I heard about it. So that was true, and yeah. you know, I thought that was a rumor back in the day. They said yeah, they, Mob Style Chase yeah. Ice Cube, yeah. um, no NWA out the Apollo. Yeah, that's what it was. Because what I also heard, so, I wasn't there, but I heard about it. I'm like, wow. You know, the whole Harlem was, it wasn't just Mob Style, the whole Harlem, because, you know, Harlem, Mob Style was Harlem. All right. Like, you know, fuck out of here. You know what I mean? So, did Chuck D and them, because they said Ice Cube came back another time, that's after he left NWA, and they was like, the streets were saying how it was supposed to happen again, but, you know, he started messing with the Bomb Squad and Chuck D and them, and it kind of got diffused. Um, Like I said, we fell back, man, because... It was like the Ice Cube. I think he did get with Chuck and them. And they was bored him at first. Mm-hmm. And then he, mm-hmm. I think Ice Cube shut down the music. Then he did some song that everybody loved. And that's when, you know, they went crazy for Ice Cube. Yeah. To my knowledge, bro. You feel me? I, I wasn't I wasn't the type to go to those concerts and shit like that. He would come back and tell me what's going on. But, uh, yeah. So, okay. You coming up in Harlem in that time of, well, not just coming up there in Harlem. You're doing music. Before you, you know, put the mic down and stuff. We got a lot of people in Harlem. You got Keith Sweat from yes, Grant. Yes, sir. Um, Teddy Riley from St. Nick. Yes, sir. Um, Dougie Fresh. And I think Doug and Rob Bates are from Lincoln. Mm-hmm. They, well, and Kumo D, who's from Convent. What were your relationships with them? Because, you know, they're doing music. Um, it wasn't, I didn't have no relationship with them. Man. I knew... I met Teddy before, then, you know, I asked, you know, Teddy, Teddy lived right down the block when we was hustling. He was living the St. Nick Project, so I met him. I think I met him through Jason, this you know, young cat named Jason, and, um, yeah, but it wasn't no really relationship. They was, they was, Teddy and them was younger, Dougie and them was our age, but, you know, they was, they was hip-hop, man. We wasn't hip-hop, man. We wasn't hip-hop, you feel me? We was the streets, for real, for real. And whatever we was doing, and um, I, I think those type of cats, like, they might have heard, yo, the niggas got an album out, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. when they bought it, like, oh, this should sound all right, too. You know, so in a way, 
you know, I separate our shit from hip hop. Okay. It's a difference, man. This shit is not rap. This is shit, what was going on. This is who we were at that time in that minute. This shit we talking about. This shit ain't no fiction shit. This is all facts. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that they shit ain't facts. I'm not barking on nobody, but you know where I'm coming from when I say this, if you know where I'm coming from. Okay. You know what I mean? True story. So so the so the internet the We made we made street niggas wanna rap. Made it all right, like, you know what I mean? I think we invented what they call trap music before they saying this now, if they do the history. Mm -hmm. True story, bro. All right. So, definitely got to take it here. The night you got shot. Mm -hmm. What, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of everything leads up to something. Tell us how, take us through your day. Like what was going on before all that happened? Like just like the mindset. That day? Yeah, that, your mindset and everything. Just how things were going. Uh, that day, man, was, I woke up, I was at my mom's house. I maybe woke up around 12 that afternoon. And I went down the hall. My daughter was on the couch. She was about, what, three years old at the time. Richard poured his sister, our child. And um. I went to the bathroom, washed up, and shit. Went in the room, changed my clothes. Now, I'm ready to leave out the house, but I went to play with her for a little while. And um, kissed her, I'm about to leave, and she crying, 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 really, really hard, like, don't leave, and shit, man. And I had to, like, play a trick on her, act like I was going out this door, like, going to the kitchen, mm -hmm. and then go around the back, and I had to slide out that way, because she, she didn't want me to leave. And um, I say that to say this, because, that would that never happened before, so she might have felt something. Okay. You feel me? So I went to the block, the location, one, three, two, where we all be at. Nobody was out there. They was like, yo, you on the east side playing ball. Drove to the east side. Now we got a game going on. It's like, um, maybe playing for 5,000. I think Zip was there. Zip was playing. Few catch, man. Me and my brother, my man Charlie against them. We playing for 5,000. We won the first game. It's Vaughn Zip. No, nah, not Vaughn. That's Vaughn. Vaughn. Vaughn's the one we played. I, I, I said Zip. I meant Dapper Dan. That's what I meant. Okay. All right. Dapper Dan. Dapper Dan was there. The um, Dapper Dan. Yeah. You just going to say it real cowboy. Dapper Dan. Dapper, man, we know Dapper, Dapper Dan. Dapper Dan. Huh? Go ahead. I was going to spend about 250 grand with Dapper uh -huh. Dan. <laughs> Go ahead. We know who that is. Well, yeah. That was the respect to Dapper. What he doing now? Salute. Mm -hmm. I respect that. I see him with the gap shit now. And yeah. Gucci, man, about time. Cut the check. Mm -hmm. Win that. Um, um, yeah, that was there. We playing ball. We won the first game. And we won the first game. They wanted to play it back. And then, you know, that's when the bullshit started happening, cheating mm -hmm. and shit. Then we lost the second game. And they won. I said, man, I don't play no more because shit going to get ugly. Then I left. <clears throat> when I came back to the block. Mad customers out there, people want work. I was like, damn, my man was like, yo, ain't no work on the block. I said, all right, man, we shoot to the Bronx, and uh, I'm going to send my man back with it. Got to the Bronx. My aunt, her car was double parked outside, so I know she in the house. Um, I had to call up to the window in order for her to throw the key out so I could get in the building. So I called up to the window. She usually would look out and drop the key, but the key just come flying out the window and shit. So that made it felt strange, right? They were within the cell. And I was like, man, something ain't right. But I got my man with me and this girl with me. And she like, I gotta use the bathroom. Come on, my man. Like, yo, come on, man. Man, customers, let's get this shit done. But I'm like, yo, I should go to the phone. But something ain't right. I felt that shit. Man, like, come on. I said, fuck it. We went upstairs, went to the third floor, got off the elevator. So we got off the elevator, two niggas. Right off the stairs with guns, the door opened, they pushed us into the apartment. Boom, took them in the back room and had me in the living room floor. And they had my safe on the floor. Open up the safe, motherfucker. And, and that's how that incident went. My sister's boyfriend, I recognized his voice. I asked the nigga, yo, what the fuck are you doing, Kev? He smacked me with the gun. And, you know, I don't say my name no more. 
And uh, I couldn't open up the safe with blood coming down my face. You know, you got to be precise when you open up the safe. Blood, right? I'm nervous. You know, situation with that, I couldn't open up the safe in my life, bro. And it was nothing in the safe, really, but about, like, maybe an eighth of coke at that time and maybe, like, $5,000. Um, so they never got into the safe. I told them, listen, if y'all want some money, just take me out of here. I take y'all to my, my house in Jersey. There's about two fifty cash there. I give y'all the money. Just don't hurt nobody. All right? So they agreed to do that. They took me to the bathroom because I had blood on my mind. I had a white T-shirt on. <clears throat> you see, you can't leave out here with that. I'm washing the blood off my face. And then one of the, the women, that, you know, my aunt, and they had them tied up in the room. One of them started yelling from the back room, just give them everything, don't go with them. You know, panic and shit. So that made them think like it was something in there. And they're like, nigga, you trying to play us. Then one whispered something in one of their ears. Then I heard gunshots. They were shooting my aunt and them up. And I panicked. And like, I tried to rustle this one of the dudes that was watching me by the bathroom. I had the nigga. The other dude came right out and just put the gun right to my forehead. And I watched him pull the trigger. But I, my body, I ain't feel, I ain't, all I heard was a big boom and my spirit seemed like it left my body. Feel me? And then I went into this bright light and I was saying to myself, like, God, please, I don't want to die. Then it seemed like I sent it back down into the body. When I got up, I was shot the fuck up on the bathroom floor. I don't know how I got up with a broken leg. Went in the room. Everybody shot up. I'm shaking. I'm like, y'all can come back now. I'm thinking that they might have had the same experience that I had. And nobody wouldn't respond. And I just laid in the bed and said, fuck it, now I want to die too. Next thing you know, I wake up and I'm in the hospital, bro. That's what happened that day. Wow. We gonna take a break for a minute because whew, that was a lot to take in. This is Ocean View, the podcast. We're gonna finish talking with AZ in a second. Be right back. What up, what up, what up? Ocean's View. We back. But you know who we sitting with? Sitting with the real AZ. Reason why I have to we have to mention it that way, because there's another AZ that's out here. Extremely great rapper. One one of the best that ever touched the mic. But the streets is always gonna talk. And the streets is always going to get their story, and that's what it's going to be. Your real name is AZ Faison, yes, correct? Sir. Yes, sir. The other AZ that we're talking about, Anthony Cruz, raps with Nas, AZ. People don't know that you took him to court. Yes, sir. What made you take him to court? Let me tell you exactly what happened. Bro. Okay, let's go. Um, I was working on this right here. Screenplay track. There we go. I was working on this right here. It's the strip to pay them for the original the strip. Original. You feel me? I don't, I, don't, I look at it now as scripture instead of a strip, man, because this shit is powerful. Oh, no, we're going to get to that. We're going to definitely get to that. But um, I was working on that. Mm -hmm. And I was dealing with a lawyer at the time, you know, coaching me through how to get this uh, this movie done. And um, a guy named Scoochie from Sugar Hill Records, who's sitting on my mom's stoop one day, he rolled up on me. I said, what's up, baby? I said, you got a new song coming out? I said, what you talking about, man? He seen some stickers. I think it was like AZ Sugar Hill. They were posting his, sing his single coming out. You think I can post? I said, I ain't coming out with no song, bro. I'm doing something totally different. I ain't even fuck with the rap game. He said, word. And then uh, a couple of days after that, he said, yo, I heard this song. You got to hear that shit, man. Came and got me riding this car. He let me hear the song. I'm like, wow. Hey, you think Sugar Hill? 
That sound like me and shit, man. I'm, I'm from Sugar Hill. That's definitely my name and shit. I'm like, wow. So I went to my lawyer. I'm like, oh, would this be a problem, man, for me trying to get my movie off as AZ, you know? And he was like, we got to look into that shit. So he bought, I think he bought the dude album. And it was called Do or Die. So like Do or Die. First, first yeah. album. Mm -hmm. And he had a casket on his album mm -hmm. with money. And the last album we done was one of the songs called Live and Let Die. Mm -hmm. We had a casket on our album. Definitely did. You understand? Definitely so did. He was like, that's that's strange. And we got we to gotta see about this. And he looked to see what label he was on. I think he was on EMI Records. And he was like, man, we're not going to, we're going to sue this situation. Because it definitely seemed like he's taking your likeness to create his lane and shit. So um, he didn't sue him. They sued EMI. Mm. We didn't sue him. We sued EMI. Okay. And um, it was an out-of-court settlement. They lost in the deposition with the out-of-court settlement. And in the papers, the newspaper, it said, what's in the name? That's what it just said. Uh, $450,000. That they said that they gave me. But I didn't get no four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that situation, according to my lawyer. Said all I got was fifty, and they took like ten percent of that. Shit. Meaning like, okay, you know, they they we we they settled like um, he could still keep the name because you didn't patent the name, but um, you know, it, it, well, that was something like he can't acknowledge himself as Sugar Hill or something. I had to deal with. I ain't give a fuck. But, but long as it wasn't fucking with me getting this off. That was my whole approach to it, because I understand. You feel me? I under, you know, we met me and that dude. We met before we talked, and, and I get it. You feel what I'm saying? And it wasn't about, you know, beef or nothing. I, I I can understand, like, you know, like now I said in this song about Rich. He, you know, he said our names in that song before, so mm -hmm. they knew who we were, mm -hmm. and I respect that because you know, eat Letty, but um. I wasn't trying to have a stop what I'm trying to do with my shit. And that's the reason why the lawyer advised me to attack that situation like that. And that's how that lawsuit came about. So, he see the thing about it, and um, you definitely can still talk to this as well. The other one, his, his um, I looked up, his original rap name on paper is the New York City '90s era Sosa. Mm. You turn so so after all of that because it sound real Tina Turner Ikeish. So is that what one through twenty six? How that came about? One twenty six came about. Mm. Being honest, when I got shot, okay, right. This is a true story, bro. When I got shot, and when they put me under the anesthesia and all that. When they had me in the recovery room, the first thing that came into focus was the room number. It was 126. And that shit stayed in my brain. Like, that shit, like, the first thing. That shit, like, the matrix shit, 126, 126. And that shit stayed in my brain. So when I got out the hospital, I wasn't into the Bible, into God, and none of that before. But from my experience, I wanted to know, yo, something to save my fucking life. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So... I asked my mom, I said, mom, how you read the Bible? And she was like, yo, you read chapters and verses. I said, okay. I picked up a Bible. I said, yo, who was Jesus born? Just out of curiosity and shit. And she said, you got to look in Luke 126. I'm like, wow, 126. What the fuck is going on? So I was reading. It says, uh, definitely angel Gabriel came to Mary on the sixth month, the 21st day, and she was highly favored having the son. Of God for out of the name of Jesus. I'm like, hmm. Cause I'm looking at 126, 621. Turn that around. That's 126 again. Like, what the fuck is this? It's 126 is so deep. So I'm looking, I'm like, okay, 621, that's the first day of summer. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the sun. I said, oh shit, this is my own philosophy, but it makes sense to me. I said, when I got shot, my spirit left my body. I went into this bright light. I said, oh, shit, this is me just bugging. But I'm like, oh, the son of God. And I know what they did with this fucking Bible. They created a character out of the sun and killed it in a book while the sun been there all along trying to tell us I am. 
So we going through this. I'm like, nah, nah. I'm, I'm, I'm like, Marty, you just need that bike. Will you? So I'm talking to her like this. Like, I said, okay, cool. But when I looked, I said, I started studying the one, two, six, further and further and further. I'm like, oh, shit. 126 in numbers is AZ. I forgot. The room I come back in, I said, yo, something is on me, bro. Then a lot of this shit just popping up, start popping up with the one, two, six, bro. A lot of shit. My daughter, her, her name is Laurel Faison, in which her mother named her Laurel after her friend. But the L is the 12th letter and the F is the 6th letter. Patricia Porter, her birthday is 612. That's 126 in there again. It was just so much stuff. And when after I finished writing the strip, where I met Dane, Jay-Z, and Biggs at, they had an office on John Street, and the suite number was 126. That's why I said, yo, this is this is this is really deep. And then we know Jay-Z is like the main one that made Rockefeller Rockefeller, lyrically. The J is the 10th letter, and the Z is the 26th letter, 126 again. Hmm. So it's something deep with that 126 that's that's making us like, oh shit. So now this should still be on my brain. So I'm like, damn, when I got shot, I heard this sound. Right? And it sounded like mm, I was going into the light. So I said to myself, damn, man, after thinking that the sun was God, I said, let me, you can Google it now on YouTube shit now. Let me YouTube and see the sound of the sun. I YouTubed it. It said that same sound. I said, oh shit. Then it says the frequency of the sun is 126. Come on, bro. That's why I say this, 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 this is God's work for real, for real. The sun is God. I don't care what nobody say, man. You can ask any tree, you can ask any fucking animal, nigga. They still obey nature. They, they still obey the Father. So when I look at it, it's like they got us going against the sun instead of being one with the sun by having a new day begin at midnight. That's the biggest lie in the world. It's obvious that a new day begins with sunrise. And nature rises with it. You hit a birth thing. They won with it. They got us going against it. Living in the lie. When we live in that, we live in the truth. And ever since that day, that's where my mind been at with that. There's no such thing as time. But it's a, it's, a, it's a clock. And they got us underneath a clock that's totally against us, bro. I'm, I'm not trying to stir up no bullshit for Joe. Right. And that's what I learned that day when I got shot. Spiritually. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So... Going All back. the way to the point, as we speak right now, my granddaughter, her birthday is on 126. You feel me? So it's not a coincidence that this shit is happening, even this interview. Because it's really time for us to wake up to become one with the sun, global warming, <laughs> at the return of God's kingdom to this world. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't mean to get preachy on you all, but. Spiritually, that's nah, get off, nah, you have to that's get off, get it off your chest. That's why the cross is on there. You notice, when you look at the, the logo, it, says, it speaks on it, bro. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. These next two questions, these are, these are kind of yes and no questions. Would you cons So you consider yourself a street guy? Yes, sir. Okay. So my question for you is this. We're going back... Um, this is after pre after getting shot. Mm -hmm. What is a snitch to AZ? Um, anybody that violate the code, personally speaking, definitely, definitely. But um, anybody that violate the code definitely is a snitch. Bro. Now, the reason why I asked you if you consider yourself, <coughs> of course, a street guy, because you're widely known as a street guy. That's it. So with the situation, with the situation that happened after you got shot, the hood wants to know why it wasn't handled, why wasn't that situation handled in the courts and not in the streets? Okay. I can just tell you the truth, bro. Right. Whether, yeah. they, whether they like it or not, it's mm -hmm. they business. But um, when I got shot, like I said, they rolled me into the hospital. And uh, they telling me that everybody died in the apartment, right? And you're about to die. 
we don't want these dudes to get away with this. This is how the detectives they roll in the, in the room. The detectives roll in the room. They told the, the doctor told him like, yo, I don't think he have time to talk. We need to get in there and try to you know. And they was like, I don't think we need five minutes for him. The doctor said, I don't think he have five minutes. And they tell him, well, we won't need those five minutes. And they told the doctor to leave. The detectives and them stayed in there and they was questioning me. And they kept asking me, you know, you know, they told me, like, you know you're dying, right? This is, you know, there's no chance of you recovering, but we need to be able to catch these guys. Bah, bah, bah. Uh, was you present at 1295 Grand Concourse at such and such time? I'm like, yes. Uh, do you know who shot you? Yes. Do you know a name? I said, my sister's boyfriend. You know his name? I said, Kevin. Oh, I said, okay. Did he act alone? No, he didn't act. He had two other people. Didn't know them. Never seen them before in my life. What kind of gun did they use? I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. So then I think, you know, I start fading out and shit. Like, you know what I mean? And then I felt them, like, touch, touch my pulse. And then they put the covers on me like I was out of here. And they left. Doctors rushed in the room, they took the cover off me. They asked me if I'm all right, I shook my head, right? And the next thing you know, I said, nah. I woke up in the recovery room, bro. So, uh, to me, under those circumstances, they found Kevin. And Kevin told them he was there, but he didn't do no shooting. Mm -hmm. And um, the police ain't stupid. They took three different bullets out of them. So they caught the other two dudes, in which he told who, the, who he told on them dudes, because I didn't know him. And um, then they told him, like, you know, listen, bro, we know you had shot, had to shoot him too, because there were three different bullets on him. And, but um, he wanted to take the stand to defend himself in court, in which they allowed him to do that. And he came up with this fake alibi like it was cold. And his wife was supposed to take, the girl he was fucking with, other than my sister, was, was supposed to take the stand in his defense. And the, the judge, I mean, the, the DA was like, listen, if she get up there, Yana, and if we catch her in, you know, perjury, we like, she could go to jail too. He said this to her, and the judge said yes. And she said, well, I'm not taking the stand. And that made it look fucked up in front of the jury. So they, they blew trial. You know, because there's just there's no way they was getting around that shit. Three people got shot, all these people taking a stand on you. You feel me? I, you, you can't get around that shit. But, but at the end of the day, you know, the street's going to say what they want to say. And personally speaking, what happened to me, it shouldn't have happened to me. Because when dude came home, I set him out right. I gave the nigga a brand new saw, gave him a block that was making about $15,000 a week. Profit, and all you got to do is fall back, my nigga. You just come home. You shouldn't even want to be in. You good. Eat. You feel me? And those dudes that was with you, if y'all planned this while y'all was in prison before y'all came home, and you seen how I'm rocking in the hood at that time, you should have, y'all should have changed your plans. Like, hold up. Let's get with this nigga instead of get at this nigga. Let's take this thing to the Bronx, and, you know, we do what he doing in the Bronx. I know he for supplies, and if they even took that state, they may be able to jump in front of the gun for me instead of using the gun on me, bro. You feel me? Defend me. And, uh, and we could have had this whole shit on Smash, the Bronx and Hall. But nah, bro. And the outcome was nasty, bro. You know, five people. Y'all shot five people. You feel me? Y'all want to, y'all going to, you know, it's just a nasty situation that shouldn't occur, bro. Under no circumstance, man. So um, anybody that look at that like, oh man, fuck that nigga, you snitch, snitch your ass nigga, blah, blah, blah. That let me know who you are, bro. You represent death, my nigga. I represent life, bro, and that's the difference, man. So those type of dudes should do life a favor, man. Just kill yourself, bro. Just kill yourself, bro. Putting that shit out there for the next generation to represent those type of niggas that do that type of shit to people, bro. We all in this shit together. Eat and let eat, man. That's my philosophy. Everybody eat, bro. You know, supposed to lead to this, bro. The fight, the real fight, man. You know what I mean? That's how I see that, man. So when I see niggas on it like that, I know who you are. You're a demon, man. 
a demon, bro. What type of energy? We don't do that, bro. Feel me? Feel me. This is Ocean's View. We're going to take another break. We're going to be right back. AZ. What up, what up? You back. Ocean's View podcast, number one podcast in the world. I'm sitting here with VAZ, the real one. I'm going to say it every section because you need to know that this is authentic and we're sitting with the real legend right here. So, hey, we were talking last about your definition of snitching and everything else. Let's jump right into it. When did you start having ideas that Alpo has something to do with Rich? The night it happened. The night it happened, bro. The night it happened, like I said before, you know, he had rolled up on me. Same night we just finished playing ball. I saw him. He came across the street, came, swung at you, pulled up on me. And I got out the truck uh, with his man from Baltimore. And I didn't know who the dude was, but to my knowledge, I think his name is Big Head Gary now. The streets know him as. He's from DC. Yeah, um, so I didn't know him. Okay. And he got out the truck and he had scratches on his face and shit. And I was like, damn, what the fuck happened to you, huh? He's like, nah, my girl out of DC, man, they had a little fight and shit. I was like, my nigga, them shits is fresh, man. You don't want your skin must be fucked up. You don't heal easy, you know? Like, nah, nah. So this dude that had drove fast in his car. He said, yo, let me go. I'll be right back, eh? But you, did you see Rich? I said, I said, nah, nah. We know Rich don't be out this light. Rich go in the house like 9 o'clock. It's like 1 in the morning and shit. So he jumped in his car. He said, I'll be back. And he went chasing behind the dude. And um, I went down to the terrace where I lived at. And, uh, I was about to get out the car to go upstairs and he pulled up across the street with the dude again. He was like, yo, hey, come here for, for a minute. Then my other man pulled up. And my other man was like, yo, hey, come here, come here, come here. Yo, hold on, Paul. Come here, come here, hey. So my man was like, yo, hey, don't, don't, don't go over there by that nigga. Man. Something ain't right. I seen that nigga like laying. I was like, word. I said, hold on, Paul, I'll be right back. And I went upstairs, you know. I came back downstairs, correct, because I ain't know what the fuck was going on. But when I came back downstairs, he wasn't there. And um, I had this girl with me. We went, we got in the car, and we were about to go to the house. She's like, take, let me stop there at one of these fast food joints to get some food before we go in. And um, my beeper, we had beepers back then. My beeper went off 911 with my mother calling me. So I jumped out the car while she was in the drive-thru, and I went to the phone. And I called, and uh, my mother was like, you you heard they found uh, Pat's brother dead, right? And I was like, damn, that's fucked up, man. But we kind of, I'm, I'm thinking like this was Donnell, because Donnell was kidnapped at the time. Mm-hmm. But it, it's been like a month he's been kidnapped, lost, you know, nobody could find him. And um, that's when I sit down, and that's fucked up. I kind of already thought he was dead and shit. So when I said, I'm going to call Pat right now, I called him. She crying and shit. I was like, damn, that's fucked up, man. I'm going to come over there. I'll be right there. She was like, nah, you know what they found? You know what they found? Richard. I was like, oh, shit. I feel like the phone dropped out my hand. And spiritually, it's like I seen this nigga in the blink of a second with his face all scratched up, looking crazy. And my mind's like, nah, 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 nah. Like, trying to shake that shit off. Like, nah, nah, nah. You know what I mean? So I got back in the car with the girl. I said, yo, let's take me, let's go to your crib. I ain't, you know, I ain't want to speak to nobody. Went to the house, I was like, I just heard some crazy shit. Leave me alone. Let me just go in this room and relax for a minute. I went in the room and I fell asleep and I woke up. And like the next day, in the morning, like nine o'clock, I went to the block and the whole block was crowded. I said, oh, this shit is real, man. Everybody out there crying and shit. I was like, wow, that's fucked up. It seemed like as soon as I pulled up, Alpo pulled up. Like, get out. You what happened? Hey, what happened? I heard, man. And I looked at him like, 
Then he, he looked at me and he got back in his car and he left, you know? That's when I knew, like, this nigga did that. That's the day I knew in my spirit that God will do it. So you know, you know what my next question is. Why didn't you react to Alpo? Meaning like what why we didn't retaliate? Why didn't yes. I didn't know factually that it happened and being honest, it was nasty, bro. It was a time the feds was involved, Donnell kidnapped. The feds in that rich mom's house got the phone tapped every day. Mm -hmm. It was nasty, bro. I'm out the game, like. They still involved. Okay. But, you know, Poe made me know that this is how A, I know how A thinks. He made me wouldn't have never planned on doing anything to me, but I think that night he was definitely planning on doing something to me, personally speaking, because I seen the scratches, maybe, and... One thing could have led to the next door. This nigga ain't hey, might try to retaliate or do something, but I'm like, wow, I'm not sure that he did this. But I definitely asked Pat to ask the whoever, the people that's doing the autopsy, to look under Rich fingernails and see if there's any skin. And I guarantee you, if they find skin on his nails that that man did that shit. You feel me? But uh, they never took it no further than that. But uh, I, I had no, out of, I had no, I don't even know how to put it, man. That thought didn't even come to my mind or retaliate him or do anything like that. But um, two weeks or three weeks after that happened, I'm downtown at a restaurant with the Spanish girl, like down in, in the Mulberry Street, the Italian area. I don't know how the fuck he knew I was in there. He came in there with a girl, the same spot. And he was like, hey, me holla at you. He went outside. He was like, yo, why everybody think I did that to Rich, man? You know, he said, why do Pat and her mother think I did that to Rich? I said, they not the only one think that. The whole hood think you did that. You ain't coming to the funeral, you know what I mean? He was like, yo, you think if I give, you know, Pat and her mom 50,000, they'd stop saying that shit? My exact word, I said, do what you think is best, bro. And I went back inside the rest of it. So when that, when he said that to me, that confirmed it, like, this nigga did this. You know, then I think he started rocking out of town after that. He, he wasn't playing Harlem that much after that. He was, like, staying in D.C. And, uh, that was that until he got caught, bro. So he clearly lied to your face. Clearly lied to your face. Yes, sir. So then The weird shit about that, the weird shit about that amount of missing that time, I had that the song was going on black. And um uh I I was riding on Hunt Fifth in the first in that first avenue. He's like, yo, pull over, pull over, pull over. And I had just left, like, the studio doing that shit. I was like, yo, listen to this joint, man. And he listening to it. And I see him, like, I see, you know how you can see a nigga going through it, like, wow. Because you hear the shit I'm talking about. Yeah, should have been Larry like, Curly yeah. and Moe. Mm -hmm. And I saw it, like, in him, like, I should kill this nigga right now, man. Because this song was, you know, comfortable. It's so, it, it's saying you did it. If you really listen to the song. Mm -hmm. But I was like, wow, I was bugging for hearing that shit for that nigga, right? You know what I mean? But, you know, that's how God works, bro, in mysterious ways, man. But, yeah. Are you afraid of album? Am I afraid of it? Why are you afraid of it? Nah, man. Nah. Nah, but after that, I couldn't trust. I couldn't trust. What, after what happened to me, personally speaking, I ain't trust nobody out there. Uh -huh. Nobody. You understand? Nobody, because that was nasty. You know what I mean? So it made my shit automatically think the nigga closest to you is going to get you. You feel me? Mm -hmm. 
But we knew who our enemy was. If you think about our story, if you look into our story, nobody from the outside did nothing to nobody, bro. All that shit was an inside job, bro. Mm -hmm. My sister's boyfriend, Alpo kills Rich, the uncle kidnapped the little boy. All inside job, bro. So the situation was done now. <clears throat> we know Preacher was involved to a degree and everything. How much now Preacher... Not himself, but his crew is on record saying he was the one of them saying he was gonna. He wanted once Rich got killed, he knew they wasn't getting no money, let him go. But the uncle was like, "Well, he's already seen our face and things like of that nature, or whatever." To 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 my knowledge, to my knowledge, hearing it, the uncle was the one that orchestrated that shit. Okay, um, preacher was mad, but. It was it was already happening, so he had to roll with it. And um, I think after they cut the finger off, and they sent the letter. And after they cut the finger off, the feds came involved, and then um, a cat named Fritz gave Rich like thirty birds to get his brother back. The uncle right there, he's seeing all that shit. They, they maybe they already killed Donnell already because the police is involved. Mm -hmm. Now you see the thirty bricks. Like now he said he 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 bring Rich a letter saying like, look, they still want the little boy. Mm -hmm. They still you know he still he still want the money. Cause now that you know the thirty bricks is on deck. Mm -hmm. So he wrote this letter like we still but Rich gave the letter to the feds and they said that for Rich to be on the phone at a certain time, and he was gonna call. So the feds I think. Dressed up, I think Pat, man, to my knowledge, dressed up like Rich to go to the phone. or White called the phone because the uncle knew he was right there. What was mm -hmm. going on? Mm -hmm. So that that fell apart, and then um, Alpo killed Rich. According to what I hear, Rich gave Alpo the thirty birds to get off in D.C. You understand? And mm -hmm. Alpo took the opportunity. Like they gonna think that whoever kidnapped the boy did that to Rich. Mm -hmm. And I get off with the thirty joints. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, that's what happened, bro. So now, Alpo kills Rich and places his body up in Orchard Beach. The kidnappers maybe say, you know what? Let's wherever they put Donnell body at, let's place his body at in the same place where they found Rich body at. So whoever they catch first is going to be caught on both of these bodies. Mm -hmm. But to my knowledge, when they Around the preaching his whole crew, I heard preacher told on everybody, and he told them that they didn't have nothing to do with Rich. And when they called Alpo, you know, I wanted to tell on every situation to get out of his situation. He told them he did that to Rich, so the, the case that they, they caught both of them are basically putting them in a position where they had to tell them themselves. You know what I mean? Did you ever forgive Alpo? Did I ever forgive Alpo? Let me share this with you. Alpo got out, right? Mm -hmm. And remember the documentary, that little thing leaked on the internet? Yeah, when he, he took him, he took Troy Reed, yeah, yeah. shout out. Showed him. Um, after that, my man seen Alpo in a restaurant, not in a restaurant, in a supermarket somewhere. And he ran into Alpo, and Alpo was like, yo, where hey, at, man? I want to talk to A, man. I ain't speak to A. Just a bit home, blah, blah, blah. He's been home maybe like four or five years prior to that. You feel me? So he put him on the phone with me. And he was like, who this? Said, who this? He said, I said, oh, shit, I'll pull. Yo, we got to talk, man. We got to talk, man. We got to talk, man. I see, yo, man, tell Sherman to give you my number. And we get up. A couple of weeks go by. I ain't, I ain't even want to, you know what I mean? I, I blocked it. I ain't want to talk to him, being honest. And, um. He ran into him again. He said, yo, man, what happened, man? You blah, blah. I, said, I said, listen, you know what? Sunday, bro, let's meet at uh, Houston's restaurant in Jersey. Early, when nobody's around and shit. He said, all right. That Sunday, me and him sat down. We broke bread. We asked each other. I asked him some questions that I needed to know. And one of the questions was, was you going, you know, that night that you did that to Rich, was you gonna kill me? Nah, hey man, you put me on, man. You know, I would never do no shit like you. If it wasn't for you, it wouldn't be me. But in my spirit, like, I knew he was lying. 
you know, you can say this now, but in that moment, what did you come back for? You understand? For what? What you going to tell me you did that to me? You feel me? So, so, you know, did I forgive him? I forgave the nigga that shot me, bro. The nigga that did that to me? Mm -hmm. Spiritually, because I met God, bro. I met God, and I feel like everybody that was involved in our generation in the game, I felt that he knew I was like the anchor to that shit. And he had me shot first. To come back and tell him, yo, God is real, we gotta cut this shit out, bro. And niggas didn't listen. And shit got nastier. Niggas get kidnapped, everybody killing each other. God said, okay, you mind your business. Right the book. And that's when I will trap, bro. To show the world, look what happened to us. Not for bragging rights. Like we was getting money, we was the niggas, I had the car, no, 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 no. It was to show niggas like, look, bro, look what the fuck happened to us, bro. And if they would have did it scene for scene, word for word, and start a movement after that, like, to have us going to the school to speak to the kids and this and that, I don't think it would have became what it is today. Like, we got hypnotized by Scarface, and they got hypnotized by Paid and Full. Mm -hmm. And we living in this right now, bro. But if they would have let that rock and let the real voices speak to the youth that was involved with that shit, put a, put a budget behind that shit, it wouldn't be what it is today, bro. That's from my heart, from spiritually. That's what I, that's what I get when I look at this shit for what it is. You feel me? So Trap is exactly... Trap is what the the route you wanted to go. Yes, sir. But three we, hours long, according to what they say, you know, and I understand that. But if they did this, you know, did it, you know, and it's still available. Do it's still available to do, but will they do it? They should. But the question is, why not? You know, but uh, that's another topic for another day. Yep. But well, we going to come back in a second with some Q&A, some rapid fire joints. My man AZ, wrap this thing up. Ocean's View Podcast. Be right back. Ocean's View Podcast. We sitting here with the real AZ. And he's gave us one of the best interviews that we've, we've had. And this is monumental. But I, it's just so much that I still have to ask. So we just go, we gonna go through it. What is your issue with Gangsta Lou? I ain't got no issue with Gangsta Lou. Man. I know Lou. I know him inside out, man. And, um, it's just you know, you grow apart from people, and um, My sister just passed away this year, January the 26th, and um, it's the last time I seen Louis we came to my sister's funeral, and uh, we cried together, you feel me? I hear what's going on in the podcasts and all that, but I don't, I don't take that shit to the heart, because I know it, bro. It was never an issue, it's never going to be an issue, not for me, so I can't, I can't, you know, nigga going through his feelings, that's, that's his business, man, it's like who I am is who I am always, bro. I don't go through emotions, bro. You feel me? And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to him, but like I said, when I see him, he see me, he's always greeted with respect and honor, man. So um, I don't know what that other should be about. I don't have no issue with him. Shout out to Gangsta Lou, Rip Rock, Prince, you know, my man for life. Mm -hmm. All right. If you could do it all over again, would you? Nope. I'm working to clean this and whatever happens from that point <laughs> on, bro. Because I, I really feel in my heart and hearts, man. If I don't leave the cleanest, none of this should happen, bro. None of this shit will happen, bro. The cleanest spiraled everything. 
it wouldn't be it wouldn't be no I don't even want to say it, man, but I don't even think it would be a bad boy, a rough rider, a Rockefeller, because all that shit came from us, bro. All that energy transpired from us, bro. Mm -hmm. Facts, man. Right. So, you know, I'm not knocking nobody else, and I respect everybody, bravo. Cause you know when y'all, y'all, y'all took what we did and did it better, so niggas became billionaires. But dog, don't don't ever shit on where that shit come from, bro. You feel me? And that's it, bro. That's what I deeply believe. You hear the next songs? Mm -hmm. They did movies about us. You know, out of respect and love, man. But uh, don't don't ever like bark on. Something that created you. Like, I respect all the old timers that came before us that made us who we were. Mm -hmm. I salute them, brother. If they, you know, you learn from others' mistakes. Okay, that's what they did. We're going to do this. And y'all learn from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this. We ain't going to do that. And you know, but don't ever not respect where you come from, bro. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say, I don't think if I ever left that cleanest, man, you know what I mean? That shit would, I mean, shit would happen. It wouldn't be no paid in full. <laughs> it wouldn't be no trap. But it was written. We, you know, if you go back to the one, two, six, I think all this shit was written, bro. All of it, bro. So, was Juice loosely based on y'all lives? You know I'm, not talk, I'm not going to say it's based on our life, but if you look at it, it's similar. Break Tupac down. kills his man. Mm -hmm. Same situation. I'm sitting, like, you know, the dude that played his other man, he watching this shit like, wow, that's like me, like, oh, shit. Then, at the funeral, Tupac goes to the funeral after killing his man and say, sorry, Miss Porter. Why would they use that name? If they were then trying to take our energy and create it, their situation from a situation mm -hmm. and the movie is called Juice. Now we got the juice and we taking it into hip hop now. You understand? Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I see that bro. I think you do we gotta do something. Um, you but you playing ball, how you said you play ball and everything. Why you never got a team in Rucker? Or did you have a team in Rucker? I didn't have a team in Rucker, but I, you know, I sponsored a lot of that shit with, uh, see, back then, what was his name again, man? The dude that I knew, oh, what the fuck is his name, man? Ah, man, I wanted to get this nigga a shout out, man. And then died, man. Yeah, but I forgot his name, man. But real dude, man. I used to give niggas money about a, Jerseys and the sneakers and shit. That wasn't that wasn't my thing, like you know what I mean. You know, but nigga didn't know that financially, nigga was back in that shit. Cause I ain't wear that shit on my chest, like nigga. I, I was one of them type of dudes, man. The dude would come through, yo, dog. We need such and such and such. No problem, give him what he need. You know, things like that, bro. For sure. Oh yeah. You said you know you're a spiritual guy, spiritual guy, and clearly we can see it. And everybody else is gonna see it. Um, you said Alpo dying on Halloween was an eerie coincidence. Yeah. Expound on that. Mm -hmm. I said it before. Something happened to me when I was nine years old on Halloween. And uh, that was very spiritual. And uh, we on the, I really can't touch on it like that because okay. I'm in contract with these folks. We're working on a, a piece right now called The Matrix of the Game, August 20th, 1987. And we're going to deal with all those type of issues from a spiritual perspective. So I really cannot okay. talk about it, but I'm going to give you all this. Okay. That happened to me then when I was now on Halloween. Alpo dying on Halloween. And then after that, like a week finding out that Bumpy Johnson, his birthday was on Halloween. And Bumpy Johnson, to my knowledge, was the first black gangster. So something definitely dealing with Halloween is deep within the matrix of all this shit that, you know, 
God has definitely got his hands on this story, bro. You know what I mean? For real. Well, we definitely, we definitely going to put the push out there because we definitely want trap. I don't care if it's three or four hours and everything. We definitely want that to get out. And I'm I'm 100% confident that it's going to happen. If you be who you are and just there's going to be real people. Doing I, might, real I might just do a, my thoughts is, you know, since this NFT world is on fire, go in the studio and have someone, have actors just you know, hire some actors to do Instead of acting it out, read it out like a, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then put it out as an audio. Audio book, nice. On NFT. Oh. And I think uh, from that, I could give the people that really got hurt from these families, from these stories, like the money, I give it to their, you know, sons, kids, and shit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, which I would really wanted to do from paying it for, but uh, the business didn't go right, but. Uh, yeah, I'll use that as an opportunity to do that. Perfect. Shout out to your peoples. Shout out to your peoples again, man. Shout out, shout out to my again. Yeah, it's my peoples, man. I had to snatch this from her to show y'all some love. She did a good job. And um, Big Steph, we're going we gonna to give, give you her email and stuff at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. Respect to y'all, man, for coming out. Definitely, definitely, Love yo, no, always, me. definitely, definitely. Camera team, peace. Shout out to Baltimore. All right. To the I'm, end of time, bro. Mob style, pay the full game over. Y'all know what it is, man. Mm -hmm. All right. Heard it straight from the horse's mouth. This is Ocean's View Podcast. The only view that matter is the real view. And we out. Mob style, H1, V more. Peace.